Part A asks us, why must the tension T2 be greater than the tension T1? Well, if we look at the diagram, we can see that T2 is supporting M2, of course, and then T1 is supporting M1. And furthermore, we are told that the mass of object 2 is larger than the mass of object 1. So certainly, since T2 is connected to the heavier mass, then the value of T2 is going to be greater than the value of T1, which is connected to the smaller mass. And so we can summarize that idea with the following statement. It is indeed necessary that the tensions T1 and T2 be different, and they're going to be different in order to provide the net torque that actually spins the pulley around. That produces an angular acceleration of the pulley. And as noted, because M2 is larger than M1, then that necessitates T2 being larger than T1. So this would be the answer to part A. In part B, we are asked to determine the acceleration of the system. So in other words, how rapidly is M2 accelerating downward? And at the same time, how rapidly is M1 accelerating upward? And you may come to the conclusion, and it would be the correct conclusion, that these accelerations have to be the same. They have to be the same because the objects are connected by one continuous piece of rope. So as one accelerates at a certain rate, the other must accelerate at the same rate. To find that acceleration, we need to investigate the free body diagrams of each object. On the left side, we have the free body diagram of object 1, and on the right side, we have the free body diagram of object 2. Where did it go? There it is, right there. And so after you look at these free body diagrams, you can see that you have the gravitational forces pulling down on each block, and then you have the respective tension forces pulling up on each block. Notice, by the way, again, that M1 is accelerating upward. So we have shown an acceleration vector pointing up, and then M2, because it was heavier, is accelerating downward. So we have shown an acceleration vector pointing downward. Now, after doing a free body diagram, what you need to do next is a Newton's second law for each object. Let's look at object one. Newton's second law tells us that the sum of the forces acting on object one equals object one's mass times its acceleration. Looking at the diagram and remembering that it's accelerating upward, which we can call positive, we would have the positive T1 as one force and the minus M1G as the other force. So for the sum of the forces, we could write positive T1 minus M1G, and then set that equal to M1A. It will be useful to us to solve this for T1, as you will see later. So let's add M1G to both sides of this equation, and this shows us that T1 is equal to M1A plus M1G. We may actually wish to factor out an M1. You'll notice there's an M1 present in each term. So you could get a little fancy here and say T1 is equal to M1 multiplied by A plus G. So this is an expression that we're going to want to hold on to. Let's take a look at M2. And again, Newton tells us that the sum of the forces acting on object two equals object two's mass times its acceleration. Notice again that for acceleration, we're not using subscripts of one and two because the accelerations are equivalent. Now, block two is accelerating downward, and so it's going to be a good idea here to call this direction positive, the downward direction, because that is the direction in which the block is accelerating, and that would make the upward direction negative. So it's a good idea to make your acceleration direction positive in these types of Atwood machine problems. So with that in mind, we can see that we have the positive M2G force and a negative T2 force. So we would write positive M2G minus T2 is equal to M2A. Let's also solve this equation for the tension. So we'll subtract the M2G on both sides of the equation. And then to solve for T2, we'd have to divide each term by a negative one. So this becomes positive T2, this becomes positive M2G, and this becomes a minus M2A. And as before, we can factor out a greatest common factor. In this case, it's M2. So now we have M2 and then G minus A. So here is the expression for the tension. Now, it's going to turn out to be necessary to look at the torque acting on the pulley as well. And we perhaps know that Newton's law can be rewritten in a sort of angular form. So rather than the sum of the forces acting on the pulley, we're going to do the sum of the torques acting on the pulley. And this will equal the moment of inertia 
of the pulley, symbolized by I, times the angular acceleration. You can see the analogy here to Newton's second law in its sort of standard linear form, but in this case there's rotational motion, so we use some different symbols to denote that. Now, we may also have to review what torque equals. We perhaps know that torque is equal to the applied force times a distance to the pivot times the sine of an angle. Let's figure out what that angle is. Take a look at T1 and imagine that we drew a line from the point of contact of that force. So right there is where that force is contacting the pulley. And we drew a line to the pivot right there. That would form a nice 90 degree angle. Same is true for T2, a nice 90 degree angle right there. Now perhaps we all know that the sine of 90 degrees is equal to one. So this term right here is actually going to equal one, so we can effectively disregard it. This means that the torque supplied by each force will be the tension force multiplied by the radius of the pulley. So for example, for torque supplied by tension one, we would say T1 or tau one technically is equal to the tension one times the radius. And then for the torque supplied by T2, we would have tau two is equal to the tension force T2 times the radius. So those are the expressions there and there for the torques, but one more thing, you'll notice T2 is causing a rotation in a sort of clockwise direction, whereas T1 is causing a rotation in a sort of counterclockwise ro uh, direction. They're opposing one another. But remember, we said that T2 is greater than T1. So what we're gonna do in our sum of the torques expression is we're going to call torque two the positive torque because that's going to be the one that overpowers and causes rotation in the uh, clockwise direction. And then the torque one will be negative because that's going to be the loser. That's going to be the one that is acting in the opposite direction. So in other words, for the sum of the torques, you're going to have T2 times R minus T1 times r, and this is going to equal i times angular acceleration. Now, the pulley is assumed to be a solid cylinder. Perhaps we have learned in this chapter that for solid cylinders, the rotational or moment of inertia is equal to the mass times the radius divided by two. And actually, I believe it's mass times radius squared. I apologize there, so that should be radius squared. And then we're going to make another substitution here for the angular acceleration. We know that linear acceleration is equal to the radius times the angular acceleration. And if you divide both sides of that equation by r, then you would discover that the linear acceleration divided by the radius is equal to the angular acceleration. So you're gonna fill this expression, a over r, right here for angular acceleration. The reason being is because we're actually trying to figure out what A is. So we want to incorporate that into our equation. Now, on the other side, we can actually factor out an R. So we have R and then that's gonna be T2 minus T1. This is working out nicely. And if you look further, it works out even more nicely because this radius here and one of the two factors of R here will cancel. Okay, so those will cancel. And then if you look really carefully, the factor of r here left over and the factor of r on the other side of the equation will also cancel. Basically, you would divide both sides by that little r. So it gets a little cluttered in there, but what you can hopefully see is that t2 minus t1 is equal to, let's see, we have m times a over two. So that's another equation that we're going to utilize in order to figure out the acceleration of the blocks. Let's take stock of what we have here. These are the three equations. And what we're going to do is some nifty substitutions. So for example, for T2, this expression right here, we're gonna fill that in right there in a substitution. This expression for T1, we're gonna fill it in right there. And so let's go ahead and do that. For T2, we're gonna have M2 multiplied by G minus A. And then we're gonna have minus, be careful here, because you're going to substitute in the expression for T1, but you're going to need to distribute the minus sign. So basically open up a little parentheses or a bracket here, that will help you distribute that minus sign. And now we're subbing in the expression for T1. And then this is equal to MA over two. 
Now at this point, we could try to solve this for a, but I find most students think it's easier to actually substitute in the numbers. Recall that M1 was 10 kilograms, M2 was 20 kilograms, and the mass of the pulley was eight kilograms. So we're gonna fill those numbers in here. We'll have 20 multiplied by 9.8 minus a, minus M1 was 10 times a plus 9.8, over here, you're gonna have eight times a divided by two. Let's begin to simplify. So we can perhaps distribute the 20 first. 20 times 9.8 is 196 minus 20a minus, let's distribute the 10. So you'll have 10a plus 98. On the other side, it reduces to just 4a. You can now distribute the minus sign into the bracket as noted earlier. So now you have 196 minus 20a minus 10a minus 98 is equal to 4a, that is a four. Let's combine some like terms on the left-hand side. 196 minus 98 is 98. You have a minus 20 and a minus 10, that's a minus 30a. This equals 4a. Go ahead and add the 30a to both sides and then divide both sides by 34 and you're gonna get 2.88. And finally, at long last, we have the acceleration of the blocks. This is the correct answer here to part B. Part C will be a relatively easy matter. We go back and check it out. We remember that we needed to find the tensions T1 and T2. This will be a lot easier than anything else we've done so far because we've already developed the expressions for them. So for T1, we're simply going to plug in M1, the mass of object one, which was the 10 kilograms times the acceleration of the system, which we just figured out, plus gravitational acceleration. And so the correct answer here for T1 becomes 127 newtons, approximately. And then finally, we can find out the value of T2 by using the expression right here. We see the 20 kilograms plugged in times 9.8 minus the two 0.88, and when we punch this into our calculator, we're going to see that T2 is equal to about 138 newtons. So those are the correct answers for part C. By the way, of course, you'll notice that T2, 138 newtons, is indeed larger than T1, 127 newtons. That confirms our answer earlier to part A. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. I hoped it helped you. If you're interested in making a small donation to my cause, my Venmo ID is below, but if not, no problem. I still appreciate you taking the time to watch the video, so thanks again.